Hi, everybody, on this rainy Monday afternoon, and welcome to our webinar today. And I'm so excited to introduce Dr. Beth Frades. Beth is an incredible physician who I actually saw give a talk at a conference for women physicians a few years back. And I never do this, but I actually went up to you, Beth, after the conference and introduced myself and said, we have to work together someday. And then a few months ago, I reached out and here we are. So I, I find your work so inspiring. And I think everybody on this call will as well. Beth is the president elect of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So starting in a few weeks and also the author of multiple books, including Paving the Path to Wellness, which we are gonna to link to in our, in our bio, and the Director of Lifestyle Medicine at the Department of Surgery at Mass General Hospital, among many, many other things. Um, the mother of several boys and uh, a founder and mentor at Harvard Medical School for many medical students and an inspiration for us here. So without further ado, Beth, thank you so much for, for being here today for us and our patients, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It really is an honor and delight to be here. I love sharing my passion for lifestyle medicine. The first thing I will do is uh, usually we give disclosures, right, when we're talking to uh, medical audiences. But my disclosure that I want to share with all of you today actually is that my dad had a heart attack and a stroke when I was 18, and he was 52. So all of this work comes straight from the heart. And I just feel that every time I get to share, it's a little bit of a connection for me and my dad, who now has passed away. By the way, he lived 27 healthy years. He changed his entire lifestyle and was an inspiration to me, continues to be an inspiration to me for this work that I do. Working towards a healthy body, peaceful mind, and joyful heart with lifestyle medicine principles and practice. Here we go. In the time we have together, I'm gonna to identify strategies to enhance health and happiness through the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And some of you may know those. You may be able to list them right now. And others of you will learn them and you'll be able to list them at the end of our webinar. I'm gonna demonstrate the power of attitude, timeouts, a sense of purpose and energy management, not just time management. And I'll highlight something new for you, I hope, in this Six Pillars Plus program. Here we go. So working in lifestyle medicine, I originally focused in on exercise, nutrition, and stress resiliency. And back in the 80s, when my dad did have that heart attack and stroke, and I was looking at the literature, and looking to mentors like Dean Ornish, these were the things that we focused on. That was many decades ago now. And after working with patients, I'd say for the past 15 years, I've realized these, these healthy body pillars, physical activity, nutrition, sleep, and stress resiliency, also for the peaceful mind are critical, but we must use them in conjunction with attitude adjustments, with timeouts and empowerment moments, with energy management, not just time management. Oh, the ever so important social support and social connection pillar. And then this sense of purpose. And these three here, sense of purpose, social support, and energy management, this is what allows us to have that pep in our step, that joyful heart that we all want physicians, patients alike, all human beings desire. So we know there are nine steps for the healthy body, peaceful mind, joyful heart, and we can understand the knowledge, but we need action. We need to be moved into action. So we need to learn to set smart goals. We need to have investigations. I do investigations all the time. What's that? Little mini experiments on myself. What happens when I have a eggplant and I try tomato and I mix it up and maybe one day I shoot for nine vegetables? How do I feel when I'm able to consume nine servings of vegetables in a day? How do I feel when I'm able to do yoga and meditate in the day? Does that change my day? Uh, and then looking for a variety of options for the rainbow in your plate for exercise, for friendships. So my friends, I love my friends that are physicians and are in healthcare, but I have lots of friends that are from the community, that are from my high school, that are from my college, that are not in medicine and just having that variety. 
really gives us perspective. So let's dive in. I'm going to share a link for you so that you can actually get a sense of where you are in these 12 steps of the Paving the Path to Wellness program. You'll be able to do a self-report questionnaire and answer questions about are you following the guidelines in all of these 12 steps. So that's coming to you at the end of the webinar. And then you'll make a little radar plot. Now this isn't to be graded and this isn't to be judged because there's no shame, blame, guilt in this room. There's no judging. We're just learning. We're just being curious and wanting to see how are we doing with physical activity? How is that? And we put a, our, our final total after we do our self-report questionnaire, we have a total for all these different steps and we'll plot it right here on this radar plot. And we may say, oh, wow, I don't do a lot of experimenting. Maybe I'd like to start that. Oh, look at me. I'm good at taking timeouts and my sleep is amazing. I don't know whose radar plot this is, <laughs> but usually sleep is not uh, amazing. That's one that a lot of people are struggling with. So I'd like to take a this would be called a informal poll. We don't, we're not gonna put an actual poll up for you to participate in, but participate in it in your mind. Ready? I'm gonna share with you some guidelines here. Are you accumulating 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity each week? Yes or no? Are you consuming three servings of vegetables and two servings of fruit a day, every day? say for the past three weeks? Have you been doing that? Yes or no? Are you sleeping seven to eight hours every night? Have you been doing that for the past three weeks? Yes or no? And do you have a go-to stress resiliency plan? Do you have a technique that you can use in the moment when tensions run high? Yes or no? If the answer is no, I have 14 that I'm going to share with you today. So hopefully you'll be able to capture one of them that piques your interest. Then social connection. Do you have someone in your life that's considered a charismatic adult? Someone from whom you gather strength. When you're in trouble, you go to this person. And this person fuels you, feeds you, nourishes your soul, helps your joyful heart. Because that connection is such a high quality connection. Yes or no? We're going to talk about high quality connections too. Then risky substances. Are you smoking? Yes or no? Uh, if you are drinking alcohol, are you limiting yourself to one drink in a 24-hour period for a woman or two drinks in a 24-hour period for a man? And if you don't drink, don't start. That's the American Heart Association guidelines, CDC guidelines, American Cancer Society guidelines. So Think about those in your mind. Now I'm going to give you some information as to why we focus on these six pillars plus. You know exercise is good for you. I know you know this. I know that you're in the hands of amazing physicians, so you've likely been over this. I just want to share some interesting facts about exercise with you. You know it's good for your heart. It's good for your endothelial cells, the cells that line your blood vessel. It can lower your blood pressure, can help you be more insulin sensitive. So help with blood sugar control, can help reduce your risk of a heart attack and a stroke because it increases fibrinolysis, your ability to break up clots. So you know, this is why I'm exercising. But did you know that it increases dopamine and that helps with motivation, focus, and learning. Increases serotonin. So exercise is medicine. It is like an antidepressant. In fact, there's a research study that I'll share. You compare placebo to an antidepressant, a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, compared to exercise at the dose of 150 minutes accumulated in the week. After four weeks, depressive symptoms go down, not in the placebo group, but down similarly in the medicine group and the exercise group. And guess what else? Serotonin goes up not in the placebo group, but in the antidepressant group and in the exercise group, similarly powerful stuff. That's been replicated too. And then, you know, a runner's high or what we call endorphin release. This can happen with stretching. So you may want to take this opportunity to stand up and stretch a little, just if you can release a few endorphins while we're going through this webinar. It also increases norepinephrine. This can help with attention, perception, and motivation. 
Something new to many physicians is that exercise increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, increases neurogenesis, mm, brain cells. The number of brain cells in your brain goes up with BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. One of the things we can do is exercise to get that BDNF up. It combines with other hormones and it can regulate mood and provide mental clarity as well. Fascinating thing about exercise is it can change your brain. The hippocampus deep within your brain, you can't see it on the structure here. That is a part of your brain and limbic system that helps you consolidate memories. A lot of people are worried about diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and also dementia. Exercise helps with all these things. And in terms of that hippocampus, exercise is one of the things that can increase the volume of your hippocampus, change the structure of your brain. Amazing. This is that SMILE study I talked to you about with the treatment of major depressive disorder, looking at exercise, medication, and placebo. And then when we look at the probability of at least a partial remission at a year, that's on our y-axis in this graph. And then the minutes of self-reported exercise are on the x-axis of this graph. We're more likely to see partial remission in major depressive disorder with the more minutes of exercise that people were doing per week. Now let's talk about attitude. Exercise is fun. We gotta find things for you to do that really make you excited. Maybe it's hula hooping, maybe it's paddle boarding, maybe it's canoeing, maybe it's snowshoeing, raking the leaves, jumping in the leaf piles, jumping rope, playing hopscotch, I'm not sure, biking, something, pickleball, I know that's big these days, something, the attitude about exercise is, it's joyful, I wanna do it. Hopefully we can get you there. So let's talk about attitude. William James, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitudes. You may have heard this, words make worlds. What we appreciate, appreciates. Some of the attitudes that allow us to enjoy life, that allow us to socially connect on a deep level, that allow us to be productive, creative, and resilient, positivity, a growth mindset, and gratitude. Positivity, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Having more positive emotions, joy, awe, love, pride, not arrogance, pride, pride in having accomplished a goal, small or large, then a growth mindset. Any mishap is an opportunity to learn and grow. I have a growth mindset. If I make a mistake, I try to correct it. I apologize. I try not to let it happen again. And then I learn and grow from that. And then the all-powerful attitude of gratitude. So important. Positivity, here's the book I'd recommend for you by Barbara Fredrickson, Positivity. She recommended almost a decade ago now, positivity ratio of three to one, meaning three positive thoughts and emotions for every negative one that creeps in. Now, that may not be exactly three to one, it may be six to one. It's certainly more positive emotion than negative, positive thought than negative, and we can often control our thoughts. So working hard to highlight the positive in ourselves, in what's going around, and in the other people around us and in our lives will help us to enjoy life more. Here are those 10 emotions. I only mentioned a few earlier. Now I'm going to give them all to you. Joy, serenity, hope, amusement. A little laughter always helps. Awe, gratitude, interest. You're here. You're here today at this webinar. So that's wonderful. And thank you for being here. And that's interest in your own health and well-being. There's that sense of pride, inspiration, and love. This grow, growth mindset comes from Carol Dweck, PhD at Stanford. I recommend this book, The New Psychology of Success, How We Can Learn to Fulfill Our Potential. She has theories of intelligence, and you can take the scale online yourself and see where you score with, med, with mindsetonline.com. The questions are, you have a certain amount of intelligence and you really cannot do much to change it. How much do you agree with that? It's a Likert scale, her test. 
And it's scored so that the higher score is going to be the most compatible with a growth mindset. So in this case, if you have a certain, if you believe you have a certain amount of intelligence and you really cannot do much to change it, you get a low score for growth mindset. Because in a growth mindset, you believe that you can change your outcomes. You believe that hard work, strategy, skill development will give you more intelligence, better outcomes. So I do encourage you to take a look at this. I'll share with you one important study that Carol Dweck and her group did looking at fixed mindset versus growth mindset individuals taking them into a study, they're the subjects, and they would have to identify the middle letter, a series of, of uh, five letters, and they had to identify the middle one. They were all either M's or N's, so it was really hard to do, and she did it really quickly. So it was easy to make a mistake. Those people that made a mistake, there's an initial response, which is the, oh no, I made a mistake response. They had EEGs on their scalp so you could get their electrical potentials. The second response or evoked electrical potential in a mistake is, ah, what happened? How did I do that? How do I fix it? So in her experiment, the interesting thing is with a growth mindset, that second signal, oh, what happened? How do I fix it? Was larger during a mistake for people who had a growth mindset because they're spending time, what happened? How do I fix it? With a fixed mindset, getting a right answer or wrong answer was actually really similar. There, was, there wasn't much difference because they didn't spend time saying, oh, how do I fix it? I want to learn more. I could do better. Instead, they're saying, eh, I got it wrong. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. The learning lesson was those in the growth mindset, when they took the test again, they didn't make the same mistakes. They did better in the test. Those in the fixed mindset basically did the same. So we want a growth mindset. So we won't make the same mistakes twice and we'll learn and grow and be more powerful. This is something that actually physicians are working on. We're working on helping physicians and patients alike, because when physicians hold this mindset, they often help their patients to hold this mindset. In this era of COVID, through the COVID pandemic, a lot of struggling happened in the healthcare world, as you, as you well know. So what do we do to help healthcare professionals? And one of them is to help them adopt a growth mindset. In fact, it was recommended in the scope, which is published by Stanford, that physicians work with coaches or therapists to reframe mistakes as opportunities to learn and grow. So we're doing this as physicians and helping to empower patients to do the same. Third attitude was gratitude. Marty Seligman, if you're not familiar with him, he's considered the father of positive psychology and he did many interesting, fascinating seminal studies. One was on gratitude. 411 subjects compared the effects of five weekly assignments. So this was just a short study of a week. And during that week, there was the placebo control where the participants were asked to write about early memories. That's it. That's all they were asked, just write about early memories. Then there was the gratitude visit. Take one day to write down and hand deliver a letter of gratitude to someone who hadn't been properly thanked before three good things in life, write three things that went well each day and their causes for the week. Then you at your best, write about a time when you were at your best and consider your strengths. Using signature strengths in a new way was the last exercise. So that meant you took the VIA character strengths online survey. Marty Seligman offers this, it's free online. Values in action survey by Martin Seligman. And you discover what are your top five strengths. And in this study, they subjects did that and they used one of their top five strengths in a new way each day for one week. So these were the interventions. What did he find? Ha. Using signature strengths in a new way and writing about, about three good things. Guess what? That increased happiness and decreased depressive symptoms for six months because he continued to follow them thereafter the study. These were self-report questionnaires. So we have to take all of this and understand that people are, are doing self-report. This isn't a way that we could use the evoked potentials as we did in our last study, but self-report gives us a lot of nice data. Another thing, writing and personally delivering a letter of gratitude to someone 
who had never been properly thanked. Guess what that did? An immediate increase in happiness score, and it lasted one month. So if you're looking for a way today to make yourself feel good and potentially have effects for a month, think about someone you haven't thanked. Think about handwriting a thank you note and delivering it. Next step that we talk about in paving the path to wellness, physical activity, attitude, and variety. Variety is the very spice of life that gives it all its flavor. You may not know that was from William Cowper's poem, The Task, back in 1785, but I know that you've heard this saying before. And we do need variety. And we actually, spices in nutrition, <laughs> that really helps us to enjoy new vegetables, new dishes, whole grains in a whole new way. And then what we have is investigations. Variety leads us into investigations by trying new things. We are constantly experimenting. I encourage you to experiment with something. Maybe you're going to do that gratitude experiment. Maybe you're going to look at your spice rack and look up a new recipe for the tomatoes that you have at home. You'll make a hypothesis. You'll test it. You are going to watch the results for yourself because this is an experiment with you as the experimenter and the subject. You could do it with your family too if you want. And then draw some conclusions. This worked for me or this didn't. And you know what? I can create future studies and do something else. Try some other vegetable with spices the next day. All right. Then we get into the all important end physical activity, attitude, variety, investigations, nutrition in paving, nutrition. What should we eat? I know that you've gone over this likely with your physicians and nutritionists, perhaps health coaches many different times. This is from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a good friend of mine now, Dr. Walter Willett, created this plate with his colleagues, half the plate being fruits and vegetables, one quarter of it whole grains, not white pasta, not white bread, not sweets, not, not sugary snack. This is whole grains, 100% whole grains. So maybe quinoa, brown rice, and then a quarter healthy protein, focusing in on plants, nuts, seeds, beans, legumes, some tofu. Walter Willett also puts in some fish, got to be careful with mercury twice a week, perhaps with fish, trying to stay away from saturated fats, which can increase our cholesterol, uh, says that poultry here is neutral, but to, to avoid processed red meats. I know you've heard that before. They are carcinogenic. So bacon, hot dogs, uh, deli meat, we don't want processed red meats. We don't want processed foods in general, by the way. We're looking for a whole food plant predominant way of living that doesn't include packages and, uh, and processing. Now eat, eat healthy for the planet and for people, that's Eat Lancet Plate by Dr. Walter Willett and his global colleagues. How are we going to sustain this globe? So he, you can look this up at eatform.gov. And you'll see it's very much like his healthy eating plate with half fruits and vegetables and then whole grains and proteins. There's an allotment here for some animal protein, which he says is about a hamburger a week. For healthy planet, it would be best not to have any, but if we're creating a global plate for people and trying to change the globe and help us to live a healthy long life on this earth, that's the plate. Now, what do I follow? American College of Lifestyle Medicine's plate, whole food, plant predominant way of eating because there's so many antioxidants, phytonutrients, protein, minerals, and vitamins in the plants themselves. You don't get phytonutrients, phyto means plant. You don't get phytonutrients from anything but the plants. And these are the things that help us with free radicals, help us so that we don't get atherosclerosis, help us so that we can limit our risks for cancer. So half the plate fruits and vegetables, half, a quarter plant protein and a quarter whole grain. Let's talk about happiness and health and how food has an impact on this. This is a correlational study. It's rather small, 3,706, but I think it's pretty interesting. And lots of people are interested in food and mood. We talked about mood with exercise. Let's talk about mood with food. In this study, consuming unhealthy foods, what were they? Sweets, cookies, snacks, fast foods. 
was significantly positively associated with perceived stress in the female subjects and depressive symptoms in both the males and females in the study. So when you eat on the healthy foods, you're more likely to experience stress. That self-report, you feel stress. Those that were consuming unhealthy foods, the correlation was that they were experiencing stress, reporting that they were experiencing stress. Now, consuming healthy foods, what's that in this study? Everything I just talked about, plants, fresh fruits, salads, cooked vegetables. That was significantly negatively associated with perceived stress and, dep and depressive symptoms, meaning those that were eating the healthy foods were not reporting stress and depressive symptoms. So there is a correlation. In fact, there's a whole new area of medicine. Dr. Uma Nadu here at Harvard is putting forward as nutritional psychiatry really thinking about what we put into our bodies. So let's share some good news. <laughs> Foods associated with increased mood, bananas, dark chocolate, fermented food, oats, berries, nuts, seeds, coffee, beans, and lentils. I love everything on this list. I don't know about you, but this could be an experiment for you. Maybe you wanna try berries tonight for your dessert and see how you feel. That's a goal too. So goals and in investigations and variety, they, they really play into each other. So maybe your goal is I will try one new fruit tonight at after dinner time. So we want it specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-sensitive. That's the kind of goals that we want to set for our health and our well-being. Very specific. All right. Sleep, this is one that a lot of people struggle with. It's important for teens, for college students, for young adults, middle-aged adults, and the elderly to really honor our sleep. We need to have a change in our culture here. Sleep is powerful medicine. In fact, the American Heart Association just recently, April, 2022, just months ago, they changed their simple step to prevent heart disease, which included exercise, nutrition, quitting smoking, limiting alcohol, addressing blood pressure, addressing blood sugars. Guess what they added to make it simple eight? They added something in April because there's so much data on this now. They added sleep. Now it's called the simple eight, the American Heart Association simple eight. So this sleep, let's just pay some attention now. Helps maintain and manage weight because when you're sleep deprived, ghrelin goes up, leptin goes down. It changes our hormones. Ghrelin is like the gremlin, keeps us eating. Leptin keeps us lean. When we're sleep deprived, that goes out of whack and we're like the gremlin and want to eat much, many more calories than we normally would. It can protect us against heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. It improves our performance. Aerobically strength training will have more endurance for when we go out to take our walk with our friends or walk our dog. It can improve our cognition. Um, if you're taking adult classes, it can improve your performance in class. If you have children in your life, either your own teens or middle schoolers or your grandkids, helping them to honor sleep will help them with their academic performance. It can decrease symptoms of depression and anxiety. We're talking a lot about mood here today with lifestyle medicine. Helps you regulate your mood and emotions. Helps you make better decisions. Well, our reaction time is severely impaired when we are sleep deprived, especially an all-nighter. And this can impact our driving. You've heard of driving while drowsy. It's a serious issue that needs to be addressed, especially all age groups, teens, uh, middle, middle, uh, teens uh, after they're 16, they have to be driving, <laughs> and then college, and then even middle-aged people who just believe they can plow through, even though they're nodding and their eyes are shutting. You need to pull over and honor that. Otherwise, there will be a car accident and, and worse. Sleep strengthens our immune system, and everyone's pretty focused on this these days. Here's just another uh, point for you to take into consideration. There's going to be something, mark my words, called sleep insufficiency syndrome. It's going to be a diagnosis very soon. You may, you may get it. So work on this now so you don't get this diagnosis. Work on cleaning your sleep up because many, many research studies are pointing to 
what happens when we are sleep deprived, high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, errors, medical errors, risk-taking behavior, traffic problems, accidents, depression. So let's combine this idea I told you about ghrelin going up and leptin going down and, and our problem with managing our food intake. Well, sleep insufficiency was associated with a significant increase in desire for weight gain promoting, that's high calorie food items, a following sleep loss, magnitude of which was proportional to the subjective severity of sleep loss across participants in this study. Meaning the more sleep deprived you felt, the more you wanted to eat these high calorie, hyper palatable fat layered on salt, layered on sugar, layered on fat foods. To the point of another study showed volunteers who slept only four hours ate 300 extra calories compared to those who got nine hours of rest. So these pillars, you can already see, they intersect, they influence each other. You're noting that I'm sure as we go on. This I wanna just quickly share with you and it has everything to do with the reaction time I alluded to when we are sleep deprived. This is a study from Australia and it compares reaction time when you're sleep deprived to reaction time of blood alcohol concentration. So somebody that's been awake 18 hours on average has a reaction time similar to somebody who has a blood alcohol level of 0.05. Being awake 24 hours, Reaction time similar to somebody with a blood alcohol level of 0.10, and you recall that 0.08 is legally drunk. This is why some of our residents now in our program at Harvard, when they are overnight, especially surgeons and working throughout the night, they get an Uber. The department will send them an Uber to go home, not drive home. It's important to take this seriously. Now naps, that's, that's another important and interesting thing about sleep. We'd like to have our sleep 11 to six, 11 to seven, 12 to seven, 12 to eight, Monday through Monday, same weekday, same weekend, it's consistent schedule. Now, if you're exhausted, maybe on the weekend, you wanna take a nap, 20 minutes or max 30 minutes before 3 p.m that nap will not interrupt your sleep, your overnight sleep, because you want a steady overnight sleep. Remember that seven, eight hours of sleep for healthy, restful sleep. So when you wake up, you're energized and your body is in sync and your hormones are in sync. This is a type of timeout and that's the next thing we're talking about in our paving steps, the mnemonic, Physical activity is P, A is attitude, V is variety, I is investigations, N, nutrition, G, goal setting. Then we just did S for steps, sleep. And now we're, our T for steps is timeouts or what a student who was a pre-med working with me about ooh, eight years ago now, Michelle Guo, I won't forget her because she was brilliant. She was helping me bring this to Harvard College. And she said, you know, Dr. Reyes, I think these timeouts you talk about are actually empowerment moments. You tell people to, to, to take a timeout, get sit back, rest, get perspective. And it's like empowering yourself. And that's, she's exactly right. So ever since that time, I've been calling these timeouts empowerment moments. And quite frankly, it is what the Celtics do. It is what the Patriots do and the Red Sox. Things are, are mayhem on the field or on the court or on the diamond, whatever, wherever we are, time out. We have to regroup, quiet down, get a strategy, and then go back in. It is actually all about empowerment and empowerment moments. When we're working, some of you may continue to be working. Some of you may be retired. Some of you may be volunteering. Whatever it is, we want to take time away. And when we do take time away from our work tasks, and, and by the way, this could be work tasks you're doing at home too. You take time away, that's gonna increase your productivity. This is very hard and I have, to, I have to really focus in on this with physicians that I teach this very similar program too, because they need their vacation time. They need to understand when they take vacation time and they come back in, their performance actually increases. So vacation time and time away is empowerment time. It's sharpening the saw. It's, it's reflection. You can come back re-energized and ready to go. Breaks throughout the day are important. Those are big breaks, but breaks throughout the day with work or again, projects you have at home or your volunteer work. When you feel your focus decline, then take a walk or sit quietly and take deep breaths. 
I try to do this with a little alarm and I actually try to stand because too much sitting is not good for your health. So standing every hour, if you have diabetes to stand every half hour is the recommendation. You only need about five or 10 minutes to regroup and then dive back into your work and you will be more productive. Here's something you can try experimenting with today if you've got work to do later. I'm gonna recommend that you stand up now. Hey, I can't see you. <laughs> you can see me, but I can't see you because you're in sedentary physiology. With sedentary physiology, lipoprotein lipase goes down, which means triglycerides can go up and they're not healthy for our heart. It also disrupts HDL so it could decrease. HDL is the good cholesterol. We want that high. Too much sitting can lower it and it can disrupt your glucose control. So standing would be terrific. It's an invitation for you to stand. Next in our steps, STE is energy. I said the energy management is key. You need to focus on this for physicians and patients alike. Take stock of your energy. When are you most energized and do the tough stuff then? I'm energized in the morning, 7 a.m. That's when I do my writing for chapters or creating of presentations or problem solving I have to do. That's me. When are you most energized? Do your hard stuff then. Focus in on what brings you energy, natural sources of energy. Now, some people may feel fatigued. It could be a low magnesium level. Your physicians are not going to check your magnesium level, but there's certain things you can do to help your magnesium level, like eat nuts. So if you're feeling a little fatigued, you can eat some nuts. You can eat some whole foods. If you have a whole food plant predominant diet, you won't be deficient in magnesium. You'll be getting leafy green vegetables and other sources of magnesium too. You need your seven, eight hours of sleep, your exercise, getting out in nature, forest bathing is getting more and more research attention showing that it helps people's sense of well-being. And then if you have a cat or a dog, petting that cat or dog releases oxytocin, oxytocin, which helps us actually feel good in that moment. Playing with a dog can create a lot of laughter and cat as well, but that act of petting can really help. There's play dates with a dog at Harvard Medical School for the medical students. Now you got to sign up early because the dog <laughs> definitely gets booked up. And then there's friendships that can give us energy. Those are our lilies. And then I, I need to say some connections are not lilies and they're more like leeches and they drain our energy and we need to learn how to create boundaries so we don't spend too much time with people that are draining us with negativity criticism, gossiping, or whatever it is that's draining your energy. Thinking about energy and taking it seriously, you have to think about the different types of energy, physical energy, emotional energy, mental energy, and spiritual energy, and honoring all types. Physical energy, we want frequent active leisure time. This will help us activate our parasympathetic system, and we'll have better recovery from stress and threat. Emotional energy, that comes from high quality connections, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. I mentioned friendships, getting high quality friendships. And when I asked you about your poll, I said, are you connected to someone who is a charismatic adult in your life? That person gives you support and energy. So behavioral flexibility, creativity, capacity to see opportunity all comes from emotional energy. And then mental energy, getting the work done, the task at hand, realistic optimism, positive self-talk, I can do this, and experiences of deep engagement or flow can help us increase our mental energy and our capacity to concentrate, create, learn, and bounce back. Of course, having a growth mindset helps us with this bounce back, learn from mishaps. Spiritual energy, this may be religious for you. Having a why, we're going to talk about purpose as our P in steps. This is shared and valued purpose, awareness of our own values and sticking to our core values, identifying them, identifying our priorities and honoring what we cherish most in our life and focusing on that, making sure we're spending time and energy on that brings greater joy, tolerance for inevitable obstacles as well. So again, take stock of your energy. I'd love for you to just go through a day and write down when you feel energized, what's draining your energy, write down the energy takers, write down the energy uh, givers and find natural sources of energy. Try to avoid unnatural sources of energy, work on your exercise and your sleep and your nutrition as well. And this very important factor of social support. 
We're at the P, almost done here in the uh, 12 steps, but the P is for purpose. One of the single most important predictors of well being is a strong sense of purpose. There's greater life satisfaction, greater physical health, more high quality connections, improved brain function. And people with a high sense of purpose live longer, according to the research. Interestingly, purpose is connected to the six pillars of lifestyle medicine and everything we're talking about today. People in the top quartile of purpose in life had a 24% lower likelihood of becoming physically inactive, 33% lower likelihood of developing sleep problems, a 22% lower likelihood of developing unhealthy body mass index. And then there was a marginal reduction in smoking relapse. Overall, a higher sense of purpose at baseline was associated with lower likelihood of developing unhealthy behaviors over time. So we talk about the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, exercise, nutrition, sleep, social connection, stress resiliency, and avoidance of risky substances. What we want to understand is the scaffolding behind that, that sense of purpose, the energy management, the attitude, being able to take the time outs and identify and connect with our purpose allows for us to live those six pillars of lifestyle medicine to their utmost. You may be saying, I don't know my purpose at this point. Purpose changes with time. It's different when we're teens. It's different when we're uh, young adults, middle age, elderly. For some people, it's relatively constant. Some people's purpose changes after a setback, like a stroke or diagnosis of cancer or a divorce or a move, or there's a lot of things, a, a job a relocation. Uh, changing of a job, our purpose can change for a variety of reasons through our life. So I'll invite you to think about these questions today and see if you can resonate with your own sense of purpose at this point in your life. When are you in flow, feeling fully engaged with the task at hand? Whose faces do you see when you think about love? What are you most willing to put effort into? If you were to write your own obituary, what would be most important to include? Here's an interesting one. If you had a bonus day free of all responsibilities, appointments, and commitments, and you were fully rested and recharged and could do anything you wanted for 12 hours, what would you do? These could be conversations you may have at the dinner table with your family tonight or call a good friend and, and start talking about these. When we're thinking about our health, our longevity, our happiness, we want to have a vision of ourselves, say, 20 years from now, 10 years from now, maybe five up to one year from now, what do I see for myself? We're gonna need purpose and priorities to really ground us and of course our core values to ground us. And that's how we'll reach our vision by setting these specific measurable, action-oriented, realistic and time-sensitive goals up to this vision. Now, mind you, we need to think about what's motivating us. What motivated you to come to this webinar today? What motivates you to want to adopt and sustain healthy habits? Think about that motivator and that'll help propel you so you reach your vision. Last two steps here, we have stress and social connection. Stress, most people understand the concept of stress. An engineer thinks about it as pressure or tension exerted on a material object. The interesting thing there is excessive stress on a material object does what? Breaks it. Psychologically, a state of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances is what we think about when we think of psychological stress. Now, some stress is good for us, actually. Like, I had to be here. I had to be here on time. I have to give and deliver this within an hour. There's a little pet pressure for me. To me, this is flow. This is you stress. I love doing it. It's my calling. I like this. Uh, sure, I'd like it if they gave me three hours with you and I didn't have this time crunch, but but because I have a, a, only an hour to talk with you, then I'm 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 feeling a little of little you stress, a little stress, a little little pressure, little little flow, but it's good. It's good for me, it makes me feel good. Too much stress is distress, and that's what we want to avoid. And that's what can cause the deterioration and breaking, uh, the the breakdown of of cells and and, and organs in our body. So how do we get into this flow, this you stress, what I was talking about? Mihai Csikszentmihalyi sent me high, has a great book. I've given you three book suggestions. I wonder if you'll take any of them to heart. This is called Flow. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, sent me high, amazing 
psychologist in UC Irvine for years, unfortunately just passed away, but he thought about this deeply and thought, well, we have a skill level on x-axis, we have a challenge on the y, we want our skill level to hit our challenge right in the sweet spot, and that'll allow us to hit the flow channel. We won't be bored, we won't be anxious. If our skill level is too low and our challenge is too high, that's when we're in anxiety land. So you're either going to need to chunk the challenge, reduce the challenge, get an extension, get, get people to help you, uh, increase your skill level, get more resources, get yourself into the flow channel. Now you may be bored. In this case, we're gonna have to ramp up the challenge uh, as so that you can get into the flow channel and not be bored. As I said, we know what happens with stress and it, the, it increases cortisol and that can actually have an impact in multiple organs, as I mentioned to you. So what can we do? What's the good news of the day? I told you I'd give you 14 strategies to reduce stress and here they are from the medical literature. Get out in nature and forest bathe. What does that mean? It doesn't, it doesn't mean to, to actually take a bath in the forest, obviously. It means to go into a forest where you know there's canopy, there's green all around. Elm Bank, if you're familiar with that, uh, around Wellesley um, is a beautiful forest area that you can walk. If you have a dog, you're often forest bathing with your dog in these trails. This can really help a sense of well-being. We talked about exercise, mindfulness, being fully present in the moment, engaged and in flow, using all of your senses when you're fully present and mindful. There's something called mindfulness-based stress reduction that John Kabat-Zinn and his group at UMass Worcester have been studying and promoting and teaching for years. I took this in 2014. It changed my life, mindfulness-based stress reduction. I took a CME for five days and learned about the breath, how to control the breath, bring it in, bring it out. He also taught me about loving kindness mantra meditation. I, I, I now say loving kindness in, loving kindness out. That's a type of meditation. Meditation is known to help us reduce stress as well as increase our prefrontal cortex and the uh, a number of neurons that we have. Prefrontal cortex is the CEO of the brain. That's a great place to have some more neurons. Playing with our pet, we already mentioned oxytocin release, taking vacation I talked about. And down here, hiding is an ever so important one called take deep breaths. This is our switch. Deep breath in, long exhalation out. The switch is turning us from sympathetic drive, fight or flight, to rest and digest, parasympathetic drive. We have the control, it's in our breath. I learned many different ways, meditation, mindfulness-based stress reduction, breathing, just breathe in, breathe out. That long exhalation will help you get into parasympathetic drive. You could use music, any kind you like, that'll help you to relax. Practice yoga, that helps de-stress. Laughing is fantastic for stress relief. Expressive writing, many physicians use this through COVID. Patients and physicians use it alike. Chewing gum is rather simple. Checking your email less frequently, that, that's not simple, but getting on a schedule eight, 12, five, and using specific time blocks to address the, um, the email inbox so it doesn't control you. That's important. And lastly, we're gonna talk about social connection. Ever, ever so important. Physiologic needs, that's the base of the pyramid for Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our psychological needs. Food, water, warmth, and rest. Then we need safety, shelter. After that, belongingness and love needs. We need a sense of belonging. We long to belong. Then esteem needs and self-actualization where we feel transcendence. We're actually doing the work we're meant to do and we're making the world a better place in some way and getting our full potential. We know data around social connection, specifically with coronary artery disease patients. As you know, that's what my dad had and that's what I've got risk for and have for many years been at risk for this. Well, it turns out with coronary artery disease patients, the socially isolated patients had a 2.4 times the risk of cardiac death compared to their more socially connected peers. Social connection has an impact on our longevity. So we want to enjoy our lives. We want to enjoy deep 
meaningful connections. We call these high quality connections. This is from Jane Dutton's work. She spent her career uh, in addressing, researching, and teaching about high quality connections at work and at home. Three main ingredients, feelings of vitality and aliveness, feeling positive arousal and heightened sense of purpose with this other person. There's a heightened sense of positive regard, a feeling of being known or loved, and this is mutual. Both parties in the connection are engaged and actively participating in this tie, this high quality tie that has greater emotional carrying capacity, expression of more emotion, both positive and negative, and safety felt in doing so. You feel safe saying, I'm frustrated when this happens. I feel disappointed. I feel hurt. I feel anxious. I feel scared. I feel worried. I need help. All these things. You can voice these in a safe environment. You can also voice, I'm so happy, I'm so excited, thank you so much. This makes me feel really good. I love it when we do this. All these positive things, plus these difficult or negative emotions. If it's a high quality connection, it can carry both. Then it has the ability to bounce back after setback. Sounds a lot like a growth mindset. So people aren't perfect, situations aren't perfect, relationships aren't perfect, things happen. We have to learn from them. If it's a mishap, mistake, misunderstanding, try to forgive, try to learn what happened so we prevent it from happening again and then try to reach higher ground because there's growth in a high quality connection. Relationship has generativity, openness to new ideas and influence, as well as its ability to deflect behaviors that shut down generative processes. So behaviors that shut down growth in a relationship. I wonder if you could even consider what those might be. Yelling, lying, demanding. Oh, the silent treatment, passive aggressive, say one thing, do another, talk behind someone's back, gossip. All these things are not part of a high quality connection. This doesn't build depth in a relationship. This, this squashes a relationship and its growth. So those are our steps. Physical activity, attitude, variety, investigations, nutrition, and goal setting, paving, and then our steps, sleep, naps, time out, energy management, sense of purpose, stress resiliency, and the all-important social connection. Hopefully, you're all socially connected to your practice here, to your families, to your community. And if not, let's make steps to engage and be more socially connected. I think about this every time I give a presentation, be the change you wanna see in the world. I thank you so, so much for this opportunity to share Paving the Path to Wellness with you. I'm just showing you now how they all fit together. You can see it, P-A-V-I-N-G, Paving. And then here's our steps, S-T-E. P-S-S. That's it. Thank you so, so, so much for, sh for allowing me to share my work. I really, really appreciate it. It's such a joy. Thank you. Well, Beth, well, thank you so much. I'm uh, so much to talk about, and I'm making a little paving wheel mentally in my own head here, and I see I have a, a little room for improvement in a few areas. Um, I One thing that really strikes me is that what you're talking about is developing habits sort of across the board that all interact with each other that sort of reinforce your, your purpose and your goal to be well and healthy, right? Yes. Now, a lot of us have gotten in bad habits either recently or long ago. Um, and I know when I'm under a lot of stress or pressure, like everyone else looking for a shortcut, you know, a quick cup of coffee, something sweet to kind of get me through the next few hours. And in the short term, that's great. But in the long term, it's really not accomplishing the goals that I have for myself. Um, how do we step back and say, okay, I've got some things to work on. How do I even start to change these habits? Great question. Thank you so much. I would say first is self-reflection. So I will give you that wheel. And you, you, you've all done it a little bit today, just listening to me consciously, subconsciously. You've thought to yourself, oh, I could think about a snack that has nuts in it rather than having my Snickers or whatever it is people like. So likely you have done some self-reflection. Then it's this, honestly, it's making it fun. 
<laughs> if this isn't fun for you, I mean, you're not going to want to do it. So how does it get fun for you? For me, it's including somebody else, including my husband, my kids, my friends, somebody, including somebody for me. So for, for a lot of us, that first step, and especially with goals, is committing it out loud and saying to someone, you know, I had this talk, I thought about it, I really need to have more vegetables. I'm going to tell Susie, my friend, Susie, I was in a talk, I'm going to the grocery store, I'm getting eggplants, I'm going to try some spices. So if you're a social person, then it's connecting with a friend. Commitment and saying it out loud is important important, even if you're not going to bring a friend in. And then the other key thing, the third thing I would recommend is measuring, especially when you're starting out. So what does this mean? What gets measured gets managed. That's Peter Drucker's work. Um, he's the father of modern management. At any rate, when we're measuring something, we're, 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 we're paying attention to it. So we're managing it. What is this? It could be a pedometer how many steps you take. This could be your experiment today. How many steps do I take today in a day? Just out of, no, no shame, blame, guilt, no judging. Just how many? Write it down and then say, hey, I'm, I, I know they say try to get eight, 10,000. So I'm going to see if I can increase it a little. And then you just write the step count down the next day. So vegetables, how many did I consume today? I don't know, say two. Write it on a calendar, put it on your refrigerator. Again, if you're social, you, other people see it. They say, what are you doing? You say, I'm trying to have more vegetables. Then they get involved with you. They say, hey, look, you, you had two yesterday. You got four today. That's great. What'd you have? So, so then you can bring the social piece in. But just if you're solo and not everyone's a social creature and there's no better, it doesn't matter if you are or not, just acknowledge what you are and work with that. So it, it, if, it, if it helps you to have it written down on your sheet of paper that you look at, nobody else, Terrific. Some people want to blast it all over their Facebook page, right? They, they, again, I'm not judging anything. I just, whatever people do, put on the Facebook page, then all the friends say, hey, I'm going to have vegetables too. And, and that works for that person. But I say, key thing, be true to yourself. If you know what you like, if you know what you need, do it <laughs> and have fun, have fun. What great advice. Um, I just want to jump in here because we don't have a whole lot of time, but I think, you know, everything you said is so inspirational. And I just on the heels of what your, your last comment, I would love that everybody listening, think about that one thing that they've been struggling with and just write it down and, um, and use this as inspiration because I know there's always that thing that we can all be doing better. And I think when you look back on the last decade, you know, and you say, I want to be X, right? Like, you know, you, when you, when you take that bird's eye view, our day-to-day -day habits really do um, make a difference, right? So if you want to become an exerciser, right, you can just think about it in those terms. But I think this is a great call to action. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. And, and, and great points you make and, and little, little steps. We call them Kaizen steps, little steps, little steps do make a big difference. Just little ones. Do something today. One thing, one thing, make a phone call to a friend and thank them. Do that. Thank you note experiment. Marty Seligman, write it right. When was the last time you did a handwritten thank you note, right? Maybe today's the day. So many fun things you could do. Thank you for so much for having me and, and, and allowing me to share some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. And thanks everybody for, for coming and joining us today. And I do, I think we all have our, our homework. And even if it's just a few deep breaths, maybe that's all we can handle today. <laughs> yeah. Or a letter or a vegetable. Um, I'm sure we'll all find something to do, to do better than yesterday. So thanks. And keep an eye on your emails, everybody, because you're going to get some the questionnaire, some links to your book, et cetera, and your website, um, and some more information as well as our usual survey. So thanks. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the vegetables, the dogs, everything. Bye, everyone. <laughs>